Good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Clausen. I'm chair of the Department of Religious Studies, and I am really happy to welcome you to this lecture, part of our department's Rex G. and Ina May Powell lecture series. This lecture series honors the lives of Rex Glenn Powell and Ina May Powell, former trustees and longtime supporters of Elon University. And the series encourages members of our community to think deeply and critically about issues connected to religion, culture, and politics. Tonight's program is also made possible thanks to the support of the Center for the Study of Religion, Culture, and Society. And uh, the center is sponsoring a reception following uh, the talk here tonight. Um, you can join us in Linder Hall if you are interested. Our guest this evening, Dr. Shaul Magid, is Distinguished Fellow in Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College. A scholar of international renown, Dr. Magid has published extensively on Kabbalah, Hasidism, American Jewish culture, Zionism, and Jewish thought. I'll name just a few of his books, his many books, which include Hasidism Incarnate, Hasidism Christianity, and the Construction of Modern Judaism, Piety and Rebellion, Essays in Hasidism, American Post-Judaism, Identity and Renewal in a Post-Ethnic Society, and a new book that came out this past month, published by Princeton University Press, titled Mer Kahana, The Public Life and Political Thought of an American Jewish Radical. Dr. Magid's lecture this evening is titled The Struggle for Home and Homeland, American Jews and Zionism from the 1885 Pittsburgh Platform to Judith Butler. It is a real honor to have him join us here at Elon and to be able to learn from him. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shaul Magid. Thank you all for coming. I feel a little bit um, guilty being able to be here without a mask when all of you guys are masked. Um, this, is, this is the first public talk in person that I've given since um, probably January 2020. So it's, it's really a pleasure to have been invited and it's a pleasure to be able to be here and speak with you. I wanna start with a brief anecdote. Probably none of you remember, but well, some of you remember, but many of you weren't born yet. Um, in the 1980s, there was a um, there was a, um, a project in New York City to try to bring New York back, so to speak, and it, it was called the I Love New York Project. And some of you may have seen it, you know, I Heart New York. It was like you know, bumper stickers and all kinds of things. And then there were all kinds of this is before memes existed, obviously. And then there was all kinds of spin-offs of that. And there was one spin-off that was particularly interesting, and the spin-off read, I love New York, but Jerusalem is my home. And this bumper sticker found its way to cars of Jews all over the United States, but particularly New York, because it was actually New York-centered. So I want to present a possible scenario, and as far as I know, this never happened. Some guy, some Jewish guy, is riding in his car with a bumper sticker that says, I love New York and Jerusalem is my home. And he stops at a stoplight. <coughs> <coughs> and somebody, somebody pulls up next to him and sees the bumper sticker, I love New York, Jerusalem is my home. <coughs> he motions the person in the car to roll his window down, and the person rolls his window down, and he says to him, go home. Now, the question that I want to ask is, is that an anti-Semitic statement? I mean, the bumper, does, the bumper sticker does say, Jerusalem is my home, so why not go home? Obviously, where you are, not, you might love New York, but New York is not your home. And I, I, I want to begin with that because for those of you that are abreast of what we might call the American Jewish conversation today, it seems to me, from my perch anyway, as somebody who tries to keep abreast of what's going on, that whatever American Jews are talking about, politically, socially, culturally, religiously, they're really talking about Israel. 
That is the centerpiece of the conversation. So all of the debates that are going now about, on about defining anti-Semitism, whether it's the IHRA document or the Jerusalem document, doesn't really matter. There's a conversation going on about how do we define anti-Semitism in America. You would think largely a result of the uptick of anti-Semitic acts that, are, that exist, not only Pittsburgh, but others. But if you read the discrepancy between the two documents, it's really only about Israel. There really, isn't a di there really isn't a difference of opinion among American Jews about what constitutes anti-Semitism. The difference of opinion of American Jews is whether anti-Israelism is anti-Semitism or whether anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And I use that to say, I don't want to talk about Israel today. I want to talk about but of course, even when I say I don't want to talk about Israel, I'm talking about Israel. I want to talk about the question of home and homeland for American Jews in America. What is America for American Jews? And in what way does Zionism and Israel present challenges to the notion of America as a home versus Israel as a homeland? So if the bumper sticker said, I, loved, I love New York, but Jerusalem is my homeland, it might be very different than I love New York, but Jerusalem is my home. So that's really kind of what I want to talk about. And I want to talk about it by using five examples. And I want to read through some text with you, because I think that's the best way to kind of get into the thickness of what I want to say. And I just want to introduce them very quickly, and then go through them. And then we can talk about them a little bit more. The first example is the 1885 Pittsburgh Platform, which was the first official statement of Reform Judaism, right? I'll go through all five and then come back. And I, I'm interested in one paragraph in that when we get to it. The second thing I want to, the second text I want to look at is the 1937 Columbus Platform, which is a Reform Jewish revision of the, 19, of the 1885 Pittsburgh Platform. That is, from 1885 to 1937, the reform movement changed in a number of ways, and it articulated those changes in a new platform. There have since been another two or three platforms that have come out as well, but they're not relevant to our conversation. The third t source I want to look at is a source um, by Louis Brandeis, who of course was Supreme Court Justice of the United States. Also, there's a university named after him. And he was, in his time in the progressive era of America from the 1880s to the 1920s, he was probably the most well-known and prominent Jew in America, right? The first Jew appointed to the Supreme Court. And he was a Zionist, which in 1915, which is the text that we're gonna look at, was not a very common view for most American Jews. Most American Jews were not Zionists in 1915. They were very troubled by Zionism for a variety of reasons, which we'll get into. The next text I want to look at is um, a small excerpt from an essay by Hannah Arendt, who some of you may know, who, to my mind, is one of the great Jewish intellectuals of the 20th century. Um, in a very contentious essay, it's considered to be, the, considered to be by, mo by most people the worst essay that she ever wrote. But it's very important for our purposes, and it's called Reflections on Little Rock. And it's an essay that is about her critique of the forced integration of schools in Little Rock in the 1950s. Some of you might remember that Little Rock, this is when, um, when Eisenhower called in the National Guard to integrate the schools of Little Rock. And there's that famous picture of that little girl who was walking to school. So, um, there's something in that essay that I think is, is, is important for us. Then the fourth text, or is it the one, two, three, four? The, the fifth text is a discussion by a prominent, the most prominent um, Jewish legal decisor, halachic decisor in America at, in his time named Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He wrote three different responses and three different halachic opinions on whether a Jew can celebrate Thanksgiving. And it's an interesting moment in an ultra-Orthodox Jew who begins to really develop an idea of what home means for American Jews in relationship to the celebration of a secular holiday. Now, of course, 
He wouldn't say that a Jew could celebrate Christmas or a Jew could celebrate Easter or Halloween for that matter for different reasons. But Thanksgiving seems to be, you know, July and July 4th was not really a problem at all because July, July 4th is really a purely nationalist holiday. But Thanksgiving is an interesting example. Is it a secular holiday? Is it not a secular holiday? What does it mean for a Jew to celebrate Thanksgiving? We'll talk about that. And the final text that I want to do, look at is a text by contemporary philosopher Judith Butler, who wrote a very kind of interesting book called Parting Ways, a critique of Zionism, which argues for a position of Jewish identity that is fully and unapologetically diasporic. And that, in a certain sense, will take us back to the Pittsburgh platform of 1885. So that's, the, that's, where I, that's the way I want to go, through those steps, and hopefully be able to thread together a narrative arc of looking at the ways in which Jews from the end of the 19th century until 20, I think the book came out in 2017 or 2016, maybe 2015, on this question of what does home mean for American Jews, and what is the relationship between that and Israel as a homeland. Because in a certain sense, a lot of the discussions about Israel today that you can read on social media or in the press is really, or can really be placed as a tension between those two things. Where does American Jewish allegiances lie, ultimately? Now this is a, the, the idea of where those allegiances lie is something that Brandeis is going to, going to address. But it, it, it's a question that goes back to the beginning of the 19th century when the French emancipated the Jews. And one of the questions that the French wanted to know, one of the questions that Napoleon wanted to know was if the Jews are a people, then how can we be sure that they can be fully French citizens, right? known as dual allegiance. It's something that becomes, it remains a piece of the anxiety of Jews throughout modernity. The question between allegiance to the country in which they are citizens, remember that's only after emancipation, and um, their notion of peoplehood or nationhood, which of course means one thing before there's a state of Israel and another thing after there's a state of Israel. But let's begin. So if you look on page two, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I have the exact version, I think I do, that you have, but yes, if you look on page two, there is one paragraph that I'm interested in. I mean, you, you can read the, sex, the, 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 the statement from 1885 on your own, but there's one paragraph that's marked off that I want to read. Written in 1985 by Kaufman Kohler, who was then the rector of Hebrew Union College, or he may not have been the rector yet, but he may have been the rector, I'm not sure when he, when he became the rector, who was a ardent anti-Zionist as, as a reform rabbi. Who read as follows. We recognize in the modern era of universal culture, of heart and intellect, the approaching the approaching of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among all men, right? A universal vision of Jewish messianism. We consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community, and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine nor a sacrificial worship under the sons of Aaron, nor the restoration of any laws concerning the Jewish state. Now, of course, the Jewish state didn't even exist yet. Zionism almost didn't even exist yet in 1885. It was just beginning. But Kohler saw what was coming. And he saw that this was going to be a significant challenge to American Jews who were doing everything they can to assimilate, acculturate, and Americanize. And all of us here that are Jews are byproducts of that project, right? The Americanization of the Jew. And this is at the be very beginning of that project. Kohler saw the challenges of what Zionism posed, and he wanted to kind of cut it off at the pass. We are not a nation. We are a religious community. 
we don't expect a return to Palestine, and we don't respect we don't we don't expect any sense of allegiance to that project over there that is just getting off the ground. That is, in a certain sense, the first foray of the question of Israel for the American Jew in America in 1985, in 1885. Right? Now, it may sound somewhat radical to us, but it wasn't really radical to most of the people who were reading this document. It was pretty much pro forma. That's the way most American Jews felt. They were threatened by the possibility that they were going to have to pledge their allegiance to a country other than America at a time when Americans themselves, many of them, were suspicious of whether the Jews were going to be able to fully Americanize. So let's jump from 1885 to 1937. 1937, obviously a very different time. Hitler was in power in Germany. The Second World War had not really yet begun, but things were collapsing in Europe. American Jews realized how dangerous things were in Europe, how destabilizing things were in Europe. Of course, a few years later, it was going to get a lot worse, probably much worse than anyone anticipated in 1937. But the reform movement that had grown enormously since 1885, because the large population, the large immigration of Jews happens between 1880 and 1920. So in a certain sense, the 1885 was really right at the beginning of that process. The reform movement was the, by far the largest movement of Jews in America at that time. right? As Jonathan Sarna liked to say, until the end of the Second World War, there were two kinds of Judaism in America. There was Reform Judaism, and there was everything else. Now, that's going to change after the Second World War with the immigrants that come in, many of them Holocaust survivors, or that's when you have the large Orthodox immigration as well. So the Columbus platform reads as follows. This is on page three. Israel, on the question of Israel, Again, it's funny because the, the, the state of Israel does not yet exist. It's 1937, but yet they use the language of Israel. It wasn't even clear in 1937 what the state was going to be called. But in any event, Israel is, Judaism is the soul of which Israel is the body. Living in all parts of the world, Israel has been held together. Here he's speaking specifically about Israel, meaning the Jews, right? the Jewish community. Israel has been held together by the ties of a common history and above all by the heritage of faith that we recognize in the group loyalty of Jews who have become estranged from our religious tradition, a bond which still unites them with us. We maintain that it is by its religion and for its religion that the Jewish people has lived. Now this is actually very important because for Reform Judaism at that time, and arguably even today, although maybe not, the centerpiece the spine, the raison d'etre, the very reason for being of the Jews is Judaism, is the religion of Judaism. However it's practiced, in whatever form it's practiced, it's the religion of Judaism that identifies the Jew. And the reform movement is very committed to that. But if we move down a couple of lines, in the rehabilitation of Palestine, the land hallowed by memories and hopes, we behold the promise of a renewed life for many of our brethren. We affirm the obligation of all Jewry to aid in its upbuilding as a Jewish homeland by endeavoring to make it not only a haven for refuge for the oppressed, remember this is 1937, but also a center of Jewish culture and spiritual life. Throughout the ages, it has been Israel's mission to witness to the divine in the face of every form of paganism, materialism. We regard it as our historic task to cooperate with all men in the establishment of the kingdom of God, of universal brotherhood, justice, truth, peace on earth. This is our messianic goal. It's very, very interesting what's being said here. On the one hand, you already see a change from 1885, which is a full, thro a full throttled rejection of Zionism. By 1937, it, saying, well, there is the rebuilding of Palestine. Maybe there'll be a Jewish state. We want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of rehabilitation. We want to support that. But we don't want to feel obligated by it in terms of how we define ourselves, in terms of how we define our messianism, in terms of how we define our allegiance. 
So in a sense, it's saying, yes, Israel is important as a haven of, Jew, of, of uh, uh, a refuge for the oppressed, a center of Jewish culture and spiritual life, which is a reference to the cultural Zion, the Sachad Am. doesn't really matter. Um, so we, we regard it as our historical test to cooperate with all men in the establishment of the kingdom of God, of universal brotherhood, justice, truth, and peace on earth. This is our messianic goal. So you see that even in 1937, when the reform movement is becoming sympathetic to Zionism, still the message is a universal one. The message is justice and brotherhood worldwide. It's a universal messianic message. It's not a particularistic, nationalistic messianic message. And there is no ob uh, obligation of the Jew to immigrate to Israel, nor does, does this statement suggest that there's some kind of allegiance to Israel that could come into conflict with allegiance to America. Let's move to the next phase, which is really, in a sense, moving backward. Back to 1915, Louis Brandeis gives a number of very important speeches. He was, as I said, probably the most prominent Ameri Jewish American in his time. He was also probably the most well-known, maybe not the most prominent, certainly the most well-known Zionist at that time, when Zionism was clearly in the minority. So Brandeis says in a speech that he gives for uh, at the Conference of Eastern Council Reform Rabbis on April 15, 1915. During most of my life, my contact with Jews and Judaism was slight. Louis Brandeis grows up in Louisville, Kentucky, in a very, very small Jewish community at the end of the 19th century. And so he's really kind of cut off from the major centers. Just a few lines down. My approach to Zionism was through Americanism. In time, practical and experience and observation convinced me that Jews were, by reason of their traditions and their character, peculiarly fitted for the attainment of American ideals. There's something about Judaism, the way Brandeis understood it, and the truth is he really didn't know that much about Judaism, but there's something about Judaism, its ethics, its values, the way he understood it, which makes Jews particularly fit to become part of the American project. Gradually, it became clear to me that to be good Americans, we must be better Jews. And to be better Jews, we must become Zionists. This, in a certain sense, is a, um, is a strike at the heart of Reform Judaism to say that we, Reform Jews, have to become Zionists, not because we're going to align ourselves or show allegiance to another country, but because that will enable us to be better Jews, which will enable us to be better Americans because Jews and Judaism in a certain way for him has, have a, has a particular affinity for American values and ideals. Now, later, much, well, not much later, but now there's a term for that that's thrown around, a very problematic and contentious term, which we can talk about later if you want, but it's worth mentioning, and that is the Judeo-Christian tradition the notion of a Judeo-Christian tradition. Many of you have heard that term used. It's, it's, you, you'll, you'll hear it in the halls of Congress. You'll hear it even by the President of the United States. It's something that's become very, very common. It's not really clear anybody knows what it means. What, does the Judeo, what is the Judeo-Christian tradition exactly? Other than that it excludes Islam. So there's something about the, the, the unfolding of the Judeo into the Christian that in some way Brandeis is alluding to here, although he doesn't have the language to articulate it, and I'm not sure how he would understand the Judeo-Christian tradition because it really didn't come into use when he was alive. The bottom of the, continuing on that, on Brandeis. Let no American imagine that Zionism is inconsistent with American patriotism. Right? He wants to brush away the dual allegiance claim. Multiple loyalties are objectionable only if they are inconsistent. This is a, that's a very important sentence. I'll, I'll come back to it in a moment. A man is a better citizen of the United States for also being a, citizen, a loyal citizen of the state and his city for being loyal to, to his family and to his profession or trade, being loyal to his college or his lodge 
Every Irish American who contributed toward the advancing home rule was a better man and a better American for the sacrifice he made. Okay, so go back to that one line. And I just want to repeat it again because it's going to come back to haunt American Jews. Multiple loyalties are objectionable only if they are inconsistent. That is, in a certain sense, the glue that holds American Jews and Zionism together. That American Jews can support the state of Israel because Israel is a democracy, because Israel is a society that upholds and aspires to the same values as, as America. Right? Maybe at the end we can come back and talk about whether that's actually still true and what would happen if that would not be true. Right? Because two countries, independent countries, have their own will and make their own decisions. And to say that America and Israel see themselves as aligned in many ways, which of course they are, doesn't mean that they always will be. By definition, they're two separate populations. They're, they're two separate countries. They have a, a, different sets of problems. They live in different parts of the world and so on. So hold on to that line. One more little quote that's, that's uh, the second paragraph well, the third paragraph from the bottom. There is no inconsistency between loyalty to America and loyalty to Jewry. The Jewish spirit, the product of our religion and experiences, is essentially modern and essentially American. Now, I'm not sure exactly what he means by the Jewish spirit is essentially modern, but let's just set that aside for a moment. Not since the destruction of the temple of the Jews in spirit and in ideals been so fully in harmony with the noblest aspirations of the country in which they lived. Whether that's true or not doesn't matter, but you see what he's trying to do. He's trying to basically break down any critique that of due loyalty, and he's trying to basically allay the anxieties and fears of American Jews that if they sign on to Zionism, somehow that's going to curtail their Americanism, which in 1915 was extremely important. Less important now, right? We're living on the back end of multiculturalism. This is in the heyday of the melting pot. Right? It was really about how to become American. And the anxiety that many Jews had about home and homeland, because, American, because America was what they considered to be home, that's what he was trying to get at. He was trying to allay those anxieties and those fears. That gives us a sense, I think, of where um, um, American Jewry was up until the 1930s. Again, after, after Hitler comes to power and things start to fall apart, everything kind of changes because there was really a kind of state of emergency, in a sense. On the one hand, Jews were trying to leave Europe any way they can. On the other hand, after the 1923 Johnson-Reed Act, which was an act against a, 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 an act eliminating free immigration to America, it wasn't so easy to get into America anymore, right? When my grandparents came to America after the Russian Revolution, anyone that, was a, anyone that wasn't healthy or convicted felon or that wasn't, wasn't able to hide their conviction was able to get into America, right? And that's when most, that's when most Jews from Eastern Europe came. That's when most Jews from, that's, that's, most, that, that's when most Italian, Italians came as well. But after the Johnson Reed Act, that was over. So you have an emergency situation. People are trying to get out of Europe. It's difficult to get to America. It was difficult to get to Palestine for a variety of reasons because the British were also, also had their own quotas. So things began to change. But until that time, that's where, that's where American Jewry was. So what interests me about the Hannah Arendt piece, to go to the next stage, is in her um, in her essay on Little Rock, she she basically um, introduces three three categories of human habitation. All of us live within these three categories. The first is the private category, which would really be the home and family. We all have some sorts of family, and that family unit whether it's a nuclear family or an extended family or an adoptive family, doesn't matter. That's the private realm. And then there's the social realm. And then there's the political realm. 
only one of those realms, according to Arendt, in, I'm sorry, in only one of those realms is discrimination prohibitive. She says, in the family realm, discrimination is, 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 is integral to the entire family. Parents and children are not equal. Siblings are not equal. Grandparents and parents. In other words, there is a, every family has its hierarchy. Right? There's no equality in a family. Everyone is treated according to their station. You're a parent, you're a child, you're a sibling, you're a grandparent, you're an uncle or an aunt, right? So discrimination is basically the structure of any family, any, is basically the structure of any family. The social realm is really what interests her because the social realm is what she considers to be the realm of education, among other things. It's the realm of recreation. Where do you go to summer camp? Where do you vacation? Where do you go to school? And the political realm, of course, is the realm of rights in a democracy. So she would say, OK, discrimination in a family, we all know that happens. Discrimination in the social realm, she also claims is legitimate, which is why she was not against the she was not against ending the racist laws of Jim Crow in the South, obviously. She felt that integration, the forced integration of schools was the wrong place to do it because it's a social realm and not a political realm. And she said, ironically, you have states that are in, enacting forced integration of schools that have anti-miscegenation laws where blacks and whites, where it's illegal for blacks and whites to get married, right? Till 1966, Loving versus Virginia, right? It was, it, was, it was illegal in certain states for black people and white people to get married. So in states where you have anti-miscegenation law, she said it's somewhat bizarre that you're engaging in forced integration. You're making that the front line. And why is that bizarre? Because she says that's a social realm. It's not a political realm. So let me read you what she says here. Um, this is on page 51. Uh, I'm sorry, on page 11 of your handout. What quality is to the body politic, its innermost principle, discrimination is to society. Society is that curious, somewhat hybrid realm between the, politi between the political and the private, in which since the beginning of the modern age, most men have spent the greater part of their lives. For each time we leave the protective four walls of our private homes, and cross over the threshold to the public world, we enter first not the political realm of equality, because for her, the political realm has to be founded on full equality. When we move from the private realm to the public realm, we don't initially get to the political realm, but we get to the social sphere. We are driven by, into the sphere by the need to earn a living or attracted by the desire to follow our vocation or enticed by the pleasure of company. And once we've entered it, we become subject to the old adage of like attracts alike, which controls the whole realm of society in the innumerable varieties of its groups and associations. Go down to the bottom of the page. One more excerpt. The danger of conformism in this country, a danger almost as old as the Republic, is that because of the extraordinary heterogeneity of its populations, she's talking, of course, about America, social conformism tends to become an absolute and a substitute for national homogeneity. In any event, discrimination is as indispensable a social right as equality is a political right. The question is not how to abolish discrimination, but how to keep it confined within the social sphere, where it is legitimate, and prevent its trespassing on the political and the personal sphere where it is destructive. Go to the next page, just another sentence, the top of the second paragraph. It is common knowledge that vacation resorts in this country are frequently restricted according to ethnic origin. That's, of course, not true anymore, but it was true in the 1950s and 1960s for the most part. You could see from, like, 
the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel series about their summer vacation, right? There are many people who object to this practice. Nevertheless, it's only an extension of the right of free association. If I, as a Jew, if as a Jew I wish to spend my vacation only in the company of Jews, I cannot see how anyone can reasonably prevent me from doing so, just as I see no reason why other resorts should not cater to a clientele that wishes to not to see Jews while on a holiday. There cannot be a, quote, right to go into any hotel or re recreation area or place of amusement because many of those in the re are in the realm of the purely social, where the right to free association and therefore to discrimination has greater validity than the principle of equality. Now, a lot of people really took her to the task about this. But essentially, what she was saying is that different groups should have the right to be able to engage in the social sphere with other like-minded people not even like-minded people, but people of the same religion, people of the same race, people of the same ethnic origin. And, and that should not be called discriminatory. Right. Now, when it moves into the political sphere, that's something different for Arendt. And what she was angry about in terms of using forced integration of schools as the, as, the, as the kind of um, uh, uh, first tier battleground against the discrimination of black people, she felt it was the wrong way to go. Because in a certain sense, anti-miscegenation laws, which prevents black people from marrying white people, that's actually political. That's discriminatory in the political realm. For our purposes, what, what I want to suggest is that in the case of Jews, for example, the social sphere is the sphere where Jews largely see themselves at home in America. There's the larger political sphere where discrimination should be illegal in every case. And then there's the social sphere, whether you want to call it, whether it's the resort or the summer camp or the synagogue, where Jews should be able to feel at home as Jews, also within the context of America. Now, of course, the critique of Arendt here is that, oh, so you're basically saying that segregated schools should be OK. And Arendt would say, well, not really. I'm saying that segregated schools should be OK if the schools that have only white people and the schools that have only black people have the same goods and resources have the same opportunities, right? But of course they don't, and that's the problem. That's, that's the political problem. That's when discrimination goes into the political sphere. But if that would be the case, Arendt would say, sure, you can have colleges that are black colleges, which of course we have. You can have colleges that are Jewish colleges. You can have colleges that are Christian colleges, which we have. Again, if all those colleges were public and they all had the same access to, 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 the, to identical goods and resources, she sees nothing wrong with that. We can talk about that. You know, I mean, there's a lot to say about this essay. But for our purposes, I just wanted to, to introduce this notion of the social sphere as a place where Jews can feel at home as Jews and also at home as Americans. Let's move to the next case of Thanksgiving, which is a fascinating story. You have this ultra-Orthodox rabbi who is asked whether his constituency, that is Orthodox Jews, can celebrate Thanksgiving. So I want to read this one passage. On page, it's on page 220, page 18 of your handout, and page 220. What time did we start, Jeff? We started at 6? So we're at 6? OK. Um, so let me actually just kind of talk through most of it. When he's first asked the question, Feinstein basically says, absolutely not. Jews cannot celebrate Thanksgiving. There is a, a prohibition from a verse, you should not go in the ways of the Gentiles. You should not go in the ways of the non-Jews, obviously referring to paganism at that time. 
And even though it's not a pagan holiday, obviously it's a secular holiday, and Jews, Orthodox Jews, have, there's no space for them to be able to celebrate secular holidays. If you go look on, the, on page 18 at the bottom of 220, he said, the, 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 the author who's writing about this says, on the second question, Feinstein takes a strong position, but to make a joyous celebration and a feast in honor of Thanksgiving, one should certainly be prohibited this from law, right? If you go to the next thing, the next column, the bottom paragraph, so why is Thanksgiving prohibited if it's not a Gentile religious holiday, as Feinstein is a pains to show? It is a secular holiday. It falls under the prohibition of their laws, but the reason that it is prohibited to make a joyful occasion in the honor of the day is from the law, and you should not go in their laws, even though this joyful occasion is not the law for idolatry, but the law, what he calls a foolishness. Now, he ends up changing his mind. And in changing his mind, he ends up coming to the conclusion, and this is on page 20 of your handout, uh, the, the little excerpt, it so happened that they, the pilgrims upon their arrival in America, did not have any food for a period of time, so they ate turkey. This was not a major event in the settlement of America, since there were already things to eat in America for most of those who came before. And there were various kinds of fruits and so on and so on and so on. But it happened that there were certain people in a certain place at a time where there was no fruit and it was difficult for them to, he's basically, like all of a sudden, Moshe Feinstein discovers the holiday of Thanksgiving. Right? Something that we all learned in elementary school. Right? Suddenly he figures it out, oh, so this is really what it's about. Right? And then he ends up saying, okay, in that case, we are um, citizens of this country. We are the beneficiaries of those people. So okay, you can celebrate Thanksgiving. You can celebrate it as a secular holiday. You, eat, you can eat turkey on Thanksgiving. In the earlier response, and he says, not only can't you eat turkey on Thanksgiving, you can't even eat a turkey sandwich on Thanksgiving lest people think you were eating turkey because of Thanksgiving, right? But by the end, he's, he came to recognize that the notion of home in America about which Thanksgiving is the story is also a Jewish story where Jews were beneficiaries of that particular moment and that particular event. So it doesn't have a religious, doesn't have religious significance, but it has secular significance that Jews have the right to celebrate. Now, we could see this as bit being somewhat arcane, but for him, it was actually a very big move. And it's interesting between one period and another and another with a, throughout a decade, he writes three different responsa and each one moves closer to the notion of America as home. And the, and the right of Jews as religious Jews to recognize with other Americans that America's home. Interestingly, just as an aside, before we go to Butler and, and conclude, in the last, um, I would say 15 or 20 years, Thanksgiving has become increasingly a holiday celebrated by Americans who immigrate to Israel. When I lived in Israel in the 1980s, none of the American immigrants celebrated Thanksgiving. Now, at least if Facebook is telling the truth, on Thanksgiving, in, 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 all of a sudden, all these American Jews who left America and moved to Israel are celebrating Thanksgiving in Israel, right? Now, I'm not sure why that is exactly, but it's a, it's a kind of inter, it's an interesting moment in time where, in some way, there's an inability to really detach from that sense of Americanness, even those who choose to live in another country. Okay, let's move on to Butler. So Butler, Butler as a philosopher, is making a different case, but I think, in a certain sense, she brings it all back home. And she writes as follows: It continues to surprise me. That this is on page 11 of your handout. It continues to surprise me that many people believe that to claim one's Jewishness is to claim Zionism, or believe that every person who attends a synagogue is necessarily a Zionist. Equally concerning is the number of people who think that they must now disavow Jewishness because they cannot accept the policies of the state of Israel. If Zionism continues to control the meaning of Jewishness, 
then there can be no Jewish critique of Israel and no acknowledgement of those of Jewish descent or formation who can call into question the right of the state of Israel to speak for Jewish values or indeed for the entire Jewish people. Although it is surely possible to derive certain principles of equality, justice, cohabitation from Jewish resources, broadly construed, how can one do this without thereby making those very values Jewish and so effacing or devaluing other modes of valuation that belong to other religions and cultural traditions and practices. Now, there's a lot in here, but just hold on to it for a moment. I think it'll become clearer later on. One point, however, and this, I think, really takes us back to Brandeis. One point, however, seems already clear, already seems clear. Equality, justice, cohabitation, and the critique of state violence can only remain Jewish values if they are not exclusively Jewish values. It's going back further than Brandeis. It's going back to 1885 Pittsburgh Platform, right? That Jew, a Jewish value is only a Jewish value when it's a universal value. If the Jewish value is only for Jews or about Jews, then for Butler, it's no longer a Jewish value. So this is taking back all the way to the Pittsburgh platform and also to Brandeis. This means that the articulation of such values must negate the primacy and exclusivity of the Jewish framework, must undergo its own dispersion. So what she's basically saying here, and again, we can unpack it a little bit if we want in the Q&A, is that Judaism is fully fulfilled in a state of dispersion, in a state where its own values become universalized toward the world. And this happens best for Butler when Jews live amongst other people. Indeed, as I hope to show, that dispersion is a condition of possibility of thinking justice, a condition which we would do, which we would do well to remember during these times. Turn the page over to the last page. You know, it's funny. I, I, I had a friend once some years ago. I had lived in Israel from 1980 to 1989, 1979 to 1989. And at one point in time, maybe 15 years ago, I was thinking of the possibility of moving back to Israel. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a very prominent scholar of Jewish mysticism. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about the possibility of going back and living in Israel. And he said to me, only half jokingly, why would you want to live someplace where everybody is Jewish? Now, he knew what he was saying, right? He was inverting the whole Zionist claim, right? The whole purpose of living in Israel is living in a place where everybody's Jewish. Of course, everybody's not Jewish there, but you kind of know what, what's meant by that, right? To be able to live in a fully Jewish society. And he was kind of echoing a, a Butlerian position. Oh, but what are you sacrificing as a Jew by living in a place that everything, where everybody is Jewish? You're not cohabiting with anybody outside of yourself, and therefore, the Jewish values that you have can never extend beyond the Jews, whether it's the Jewish state or the Jewish people. She writes, and here I'm not only referring to multiple strains within the Jewish tradition, but ways in which Jewish resources can come to be taken up and elaborated within non-Jewish discourses, and why this particular form of linguistic crossing is actually central to what Jewish resources are and can be. Only by entering into a field of cultural translation do particular ethical resources become generalizable and effective. This is not only a descriptive claim. Religious traditions only thrive through being in contact with other religions and non-religious institutions, discourses, and values. So in a certain way, what she's doing is she's trying to take the basic claim of exclusivity when it comes to religion and turn it on its head. Religions don't function best when they are internal to themselves. Religions function best, in other words, they wear their best clothes. They are their best selves when they're engaging with those that are not from that tradition. And the other tradition outside of them is doing that. So it's, it's the kind of multicultural cohabitation that for Butler is the most, is the, uh, provides the best condition for flourishing of the group. In this case, the flourishing of the Jews. 
Only by being displaced and transposed from one spatio-temporal configuration to another does a tradition make some kind of contact with alterity, the field of the not me. Now, of course, there are many ways to respond to this. Somebody could say, oh yeah, that's actually, that, that's very nice, except if the not me wants to kill the me. Right? And this then addresses the question of anti-Semitism and whether, and whether anti-Semitism really makes Butler's vision impossible. Right? But that's really for another time, just to state that. So what Butler is saying is that the notion of exile in the Jewish tradition is not a fallen realm. It actually is the great blessing because it enables Jews to be able to interact with others. Again, let's take the, his the history out of it for a moment at least. Interact with others and in doing so, fulfill the values that it proclaims. Now she would say, yes, of course, the Jews lived in horrible conditions and horrible places throughout history, but she claims that America is the place where that can be done. And interestingly enough, although I can't get into it right now, I also think that people like the Lubavitcher Rebbe also felt that. When he said that the Messiah will come from America, that exile will end from America and not in Israel, he was saying that America provides the conditions for the possibility of the fulfillment of the Messianic mission. So let me stop here, and um, we'll be able to unpack some of these during some questions. Thank you. Go ahead, sure. Um, okay, so the first one, why do you feel that Brandeis became so prominent versus other Jewish Americans? Brandeis? Yes. Well, I mean, he became so prominent because he was elected to the Supreme Court, obviously. And, and in a way, he, in some sense, embodied the ultimate, at that time, right, the ultimate, uh, he represented the ultimate Jewish success story, right? Somebody that can come from very humble beginnings in Louisville, in Louisville Kentucky, from a Jewish home, um, and become, and become a, a member of the Supreme Court. Now, of course, many others have followed in his path subsequent, subsequent to that. But even as even as a even as a Supreme Court justice, he was really very very respected on the bench as being um, both a great legal mind, but also somebody who had compassion. And in a certain sense, he became the poster boy for American Jewry at that at that time. Not because he knew that much about Judaism; he actually didn't know that much about Judaism. But it didn't it didn't really matter. What mattered is that he was a Supreme Court justice which I know now doesn't necessarily mean as much as it meant then, but certainly at that time it meant a lot. So I wonder if you'll talk about why you're choosing to stick with this Arendt piece, because I find it very problematic. You know, I mean, we could go into details around that, but I hear you saying the social space, right? I get that, but it's still an incredibly problematic argument. Yeah, it, it is, and, and actually she, she really got she got beat up for Eichmann in Jerusalem probably more than she did for this essay. But she did recognize after the essay, she had a somewhat, of, she, she stepped back someone's beat and said, oh, well, I, I guess I really don't understand the black experience in the South. I think that's really what the critique was. She was trying to make a kind of highfalutin philosophical argument and she was, and, and people were saying, you have no idea what's going on in Arkansas. You have no idea what's going on in Jim Crow, which was all true, and she acknowledged that. And, and so that's why the, the argument, in a sense, doesn't, it doesn't really, it doesn't really have any teeth because it's so, it seems to contradict reality. But I think the distinction between the private, the, the social, and the political is a, is a good one to think with, and that's 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 why I like it. So I'm not I'm not really advocating her 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 argument because it doesn't it doesn't work in the real world. But she's using this as an example. And again, she's not she's not against dismantling Jim Crow, and she's not against civil rights. She doesn't think that that was the place to do it. And in particular, you know, it's very interesting because she says somewhere else, maybe even in the in the, in the essay, she said the reason that she wrote the article was that she saw that photograph of that sixth grade 
black girl going to school. And she was so traumatized by how that girl must have been traumatized. Like, why put a sixth grade black girl into that position where she's getting jeered at and spit on by white people? Like, what? I think that, she says, I think, in the beginning of the essay, that's what really got her, like, wait, this is not the way. Right? Why victimize this innocent person? So, but obviously we agree in terms of the problem. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not sure. Are you working this up into an article or a... At some point, I mean, the question will be whether a rent will make yeah, it in, right? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Right, right, yeah. And, and I would love to find some other place where she distinguishes between the private social and, yeah. and political, and maybe I won't find it, but, but you're right. There will have to be a lot of caveats, right? <laughs> Yes. How or do you think that the recent rise in anti-Semitism in America will affect American Jews uphold their Judaism in the way that Judith Butler and Brandon are suggesting? That's a great question. Um, um, and and it, it allows me to make a comment about, about the anti-Semitism that, that, you, that you raised. In, in terms of your question itself, like it's not clear. For example, um, if you read Barry Weiss's book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism, at the end of the book, she says, oh, the best way to fight anti-Semitism is to be more of a Jew. Right? That's, that's kind of the take home message. Although I don't particularly think that's a very constructive one, because it really does create something that, that so a scholar, Jacob Newsman, called negative Judaism. Like, I'm going to be a Jew because people hate me. Or, and, and the more they hate me, the more I'm going to be a Jew. First of all, I don't think that's the necessarily the healthiest way to be anything. And second of all, it's not going to make the people hate you any less. So I'm not sure what problem it actually solves. But, but, but on the anti-Semitism question, I think there's something that's worth thinking about, which I've written about in an essay that's, that's, given, that's coming out in a couple of months. I think we have to make a distinction between anti-Semitic acts and anti-Semitism as a problem. So there's no doubt that there's an uptick in anti-Semitic acts in this country, right? And we could talk about Poway, we could talk about Pittsburgh, we could talk about a lot of other things, we could talk about Charlottesville, right? We, don't, we, can, we all know the story, right? There's a difference between that and anti-Semitism as a problem. And the difference is social tolerance. So, if a person commits an anti-Semitic act, what is the nature of the social tolerance in our society for that act? And I think that it means sociologists from 50 years ago, Earl Rapp made the distinction between folk anti-Semitism and political anti-Semitism. In the folk anti-Semitism, he says, yeah, I mean, people have negative attitudes, they have negative attitudes, so it's a lot of people, right? As James Baldwin said, like, everybody hates everybody. So, folk anti-Semitism is that, folk anti-Semitism is not a problem. The problem is when the folk anti-Semitism becomes political, right? So, is there social, to, is there increased social tolerance for the uptick in anti-Semitic acts? And, and I would suggest not really. I mean, President Biden just appointed an envoy, a special envoy, to fight anti-Semitism, which I think is a great idea. There's no special envoy to fight racism, and there's no special envoy to fight Islamophobia, but there is a special envoy to fight anti-Semitism. Now, you might say, oh, that's because anti-Semitism is such a problem, and I might respond, no, that's because you see that it's not a problem because there's no social tolerance for it. So, as an example, when a friend of mine came back from Prague and said, Anti-Semitism is so bad in Prague, there's such a problem in Prague that when you go to synagogues, they have Czech police at the door that check your bags before you go into the synagogue to make sure you know, you're not carrying, I guess, a weapon or whatever. And my response to him was, if there was really a problem of anti-Semitism in Prague, there would be no Czech police in the synagogue. Right? The fact that the government is putting its resources into protecting Jews is saying there is a threat of anti-Semitism and there really isn't social tolerance for it. 
So I think we have to think about that. We can talk more about that, but I think we have to think about that distinction in terms of understanding what anti-Semitism is in America today. And I think that it's too easy to just kind of move into this not notion of anti-Semitism is such a problem. Look at what's happening, look at what's happening, look at what's happening. Yes, what's happening is problematic because people are acting out in very negative ways towards Jews or towards Jewish property, or whatever. But from where I stand, I don't really see the social tolerance. And that, in a certain sense, with it was with the day to you. Um, I mean, I think both racism and Islamophobia are, are problems, for sure. Yeah, right? yeah, no, but you're saying that because there's already, I don't, I mean, I, I guess so that person would have to show me some evidence where that's the case. I mean, certainly you can make that case for racism. I don't know if you can make that case for Islamophobia. I mean, you know, after, the, after, the, after Biden announced the envoy, uh, for anti-Semitism, um, Rashi Tlaib, who is a, a Palestinian rep a congresswoman from Minnesota, Minnesota she's Michigan, basically came out with a statement that that all the that all the what I saw in terms of the Jewish media came out strongly against. But in a certain sense, she was saying something pretty interesting. She says, "I applaud the president's appointing of an envoy to fight anti-Semitism." I now think he should appoint an envoy to fight Islamophobia. And the White House didn't respond. So maybe it will respond. And maybe, maybe Biden will do that. So I'm, I'm just saying that if we see anti-Semitism as a form of hatred toward a group, which is one of other forms of hatred towards other groups, of which there are, we saw a great uptick in act against Asian Americans, too, after the beginning of COVID, right? Forgetting about the internment of Japanese during World War II, I mean, there's a whole history there, and the, the, Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese Restriction Act in, in the late 19th century. These things, are, these things are important, and these things need to be dealt with, but I think the question is, about social tolerance. Now, you can make the argument, and I, I would agree with you if you did, there's much more social tolerance in this country for racism than there is for anti semitism And yet, right, we still are fighting about what it means to teach slavery from the perspective of slaves in the 1619 Project. You're still seeing that pushback. I mean, so therein lies, I think, the complexity on it. I mean, one thing I, I just add that I think is, is interesting is the case of Charlottesville, which was originally a, um, a demonstration that was really against immigration from black countries and black people. And in a certain sense, what it became was an expression of anti-Semitism with the kind of Jews will not replace us, but it would seem kind of odd because it wasn't even about the Jews. I mean, the demonstration wasn't even about the Jews. Somehow, in a certain sense, it's, it's a very interesting anxiety that really speaks to your point, which is that the people who marched in Charlottesville are not afraid that blacks will replace them because they know that they won't without some kind of revolutionary movement. But they are afraid that Jews will replace them. And I think that it was interesting that that kind of anxiety came out of Charlottesville, as an anti-Semitic anxiety came out of Charlottesville when it was really a question about race and not about, um, about Jews. Yes. Well, 
it is true, yes, I, I do agree with you. And this actually really relates very much to, 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 the, to, to the talk itself. I want to kind of, like, I think I can swing it back in, that I think American Jews today, because of the rise in anti-Semitic acts, are feeling more anxious than they have in a long time. Certainly not as anxious as they did in the 1930s, right, after the, after the Depression with Father Coughlin, who was giving these anti-Semitic radio addresses, and Henry Ford, who was publishing The International Jew, right? I mean, things were actually much worse then in a lot of ways. But still, I think American Jews are feeling anxious about home because anti-Semitism has gotten swept in to white supremacy. You know, it's kind of interesting. There's a, there's a piece by, um, uh, Henry, by Harold Cruz, who's an uh, African-American intellectual who wrote a book called The, the, uh, the Crisis of the Negro Intellectual in 1967. And he said that there really isn't, wait, it's either him or it might be Earl Rapp, doesn't matter. He said there really isn't a Jew, there, there, there was really never a Jewish question in America the way there was in Europe, because the Jews came to America as emancipated people. So as in terms of the Jewish question, it was like, oh, what do we do with the Jews? Can the Jews assimilate? That was the European question. America, George Washington wrote his letter to the Jews of Newport Synagogue in 1791, said, you're welcome here as a community, you know, as long as you're part of the American project. So what he argues is that the Jewish question raises its head again in America with what he calls the Negro question. In other words, once blacks are fighting for right and power, it will evoke the, white, the whiteness of America, called white supremacy, whatever, um, against them and then the Jews will be swept into it. So that in a sense, the Jews, you know, according to this argument, the anti-Semitism in America gets swept into the racial question. And then you have Charlottesville Jews who are not replace us. Now, whether you buy that argument or not, that's, that's one way of looking at it, that in a certain sense, the Jewish question exists now in America not because of the Jews, per se, but because of the anxiety of white America in feeling that it's going to lose its majority, which it is going to lose. Not to Jews, Jews make up 2% of the population, right? I mean, what threat is there really, right? It's really about something else. Yes? Um, thank you so much, this was really uh, incredibly fascinating. One question I was left with after you presented Judith Butler that connects to some extent with what you were just addressing is um, whether the text you presented is actually specifically addressing the United States, where she is making a much larger argument about um, cohabitation and spiritual rights anywhere but don't go to Israel, right? Like especially with what you were describing, the history of Jews in Europe is a very different one right. than the history of Jews in the United States. So I was wondering if she is making distinction there or if she is um, generally arguing cohabitation anywhere outside of uh, the state of Israel or Jewish people. I th it's a good question. I think that she's making the, she's making the argument in a general sense. But I think she would acknowledge that America is the best place for it to actually Occur. You know, the conditions are here are better than they are. I mean, she's not unaware of you know, the problem of anti Semitism in other European countries. So, I, I, I mean, I think, I think she, I think as a philosopher and not as a historian, I think she would probably say, no, this has to go throughout. And that exile itself is not a curse, but actually is a blessing in that it enables the Jews to fulfill them, be, to become the best selves that they are. Now, interestingly enough, there are, ta there are statements in the Talmud that make similar kinds of things. They don't talk about it in that way, but they certainly talk about the opportunities of exile. And for her, 
in a way, she's considered to be a kind of anti-Zionist, which she which actually is, but an anti-Zionist and an anti-Israel thinker. I think the emphasis there is mistaken. She is basically a, full, a fully diasporic Jewish thinker. Right? She thinks that that diaspora is, is, in a certain sense, a better place to fulfill the universal values of Judaism. And she would say, and there is, I think, some empirical evidence to this claim, that if you take those Jewish values and you put them in a fully Jewish context and you create from that a nation state that has others in it, it very, very easily turns into a very problematic Jewish position, right? Um, call it ethno-nationalism, call it you know, whatever, whatever you want. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But it sure is easy then for it to be that way. And I think you can see, you know, I think you can see um, in Israel where in many ways that's, that's precisely what's happening. In nation state law in 2018, the way in which, in a certain sense, her reading of Israel, her reading of, of Israel is a Jewish nation state with hegemony over a non-Jewish population will very easily slip into a hyper-nationalism. Whereas the exilic state, off, this is her argument anyway, the exilic state offers the possibility for, for the fulfillment of those Jewish values because, again, let's go back to Brandeis, right? Judaism, according to Brandeis, prepares the Jews to fit into the democratic project that is America. Right, that's basically the way he sees it. So, so, so in a way, Butler is like Reform Judaism 2.0 or Reform Judaism 3.0. What she's doing is espousing a kind of Reform Judaism now confronted by the, the difficult and challenging um, nature of the state of Israel in relationship to American Jewish identity. Have we solved all the problems? Yeah. Do you think Butler's argument will hold, like, holds more value or is more compelling for American Jews as opposed to I guess, returning to Israel because of praise that the Jews are not? Well, um, I mean, the book, I wouldn't say that the book was well received in the American Jewish community, obviously. Um, so I think the consensus would be um, that it, it, it did not have that, put it this way, it did not have that impact. But, but partly it did not have that impact because of what I said right at the beginning, that whatever Jews are talking about in America, they're talking about Israel. And that, it, that Israel is, for all kinds of reasons, good and bad, and it doesn't really even matter which, has, has implanted itself in the American psych, Jewish psyche such that something like Butler who say, you know, who, who basically says, oh, you know that, that Zionist project really wasn't a very good idea, right? I don't think American mm -hmm. Jews are going to buy it at this point, for sure. Right? Although younger American Jews, mostly your generation, Gen, Gen Z, we're all Gen Z, right? Unless those that are not, right? I think, I, th I know I see that you're not yet. Um, but those, that, those in your generation, American Jews in your generation, think differently about this um, and have not really been brought up the way I was brought up, uh, which was that, you know, every time you hear the opening score of the film Exodus, you start to cry, right? There's a certain kind of nostalgia of, you know, um, of Israel that, that, that was just part of what we were fed for breakfast. And a lot of you don't really have that for a variety because your experience is different, right? And so it's, it's, it's certainly going to be the case. You're all post-Second Intifada human beings. And so there's, you know, when, when, when your parents or grandparents say, oh, no, 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 why are you be some more of Israel? I mean, the answer is like, look, my experience is different than yours. I just don't, that, that's not the way. I see, I see the situation as a much, much more complicated way. And you can come out on various sides of that story, but that, that, you know, at least, at least my generation has to at least acknowledge that your generation has that different experience that it's thinking from. 
Other questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile. So I'm thinking about what you're saying about the sweeping in of anti Semitism into racism. And then I'm thinking about Eric Ward, who writes about. You're thinking about Eric Ward, yeah. Right, who writes about anti Semitism kind of at the core of white supremacy, coupled and then with racism, as kind of the, the mechanism for it. Um, and how, you know, you can't get, and it's no point to Eric Ward's writing, you can't get rid of. Racism until you address anti-Semitism. So I'm wondering, I'm just trying to reconcile the the, the sweeping in versus the core. Right. I mean, I don't. I, I get that. I, it's a good question. You know, it's kind of what's worse, what brings forth what. And I, I don't. I don't. It's certainly in the American context. Well, I'll say it differently. If you look, if you go back to the 19th century in European race science, it's certainly the case that the concept of race as it was formed in the 19th century, and I think race goes much further back, is, which then comes back to haunt blackness in America, um, is really about the Jews in the beginning. Right? When, when 19th century and 18th century Enlightenment thinkers started to think about race, they were thinking about the Jews. They weren't thinking about black people. There were no black people. I mean, they didn't exist for them in any way. So it is true that the Jew is implicated in the modern construction of race. Although I, I do think that race goes much further, further back than that, and that in the American context, I don't think that's true. I think it's true in the European context. I think in the American context, race is that Kind of the way the critical race theorists say, like, we're not talking about, this is what the critical race theorists will say, right? We're not talking about race in America, we're talking about anti blackness. And then racism is something else against other people. But they want to see anti blackness as categorically different. In similar ways that Jews want to see anti Semitism as categorically different, right? So both are making very similar claims about the nature of their own, the nature of the hatred towards them, except in the American context, I think it's a very hard argument to make that, 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 um, well, put it differently, to be, to be and to live as a Jew in America is simply categorically different than to be and to live as a black person in America. And I think that, that it, therefore, on an experiential level, I don't really think that you can make that claim about America. But again, the racialization process really happens in Europe, which is in a different context. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. And please thank join you. me in thanking Dr. Solomon.